Um, we've got another very uh, exciting panel coming up, but just before that, um, you're going to have a few words from um, someone who is a brilliant businessman and very accomplished. He's also a patron and benefactor of the Public Health Collaboration. Uh, he's very passionate about preventing and reversing type 2 diabetes across the nation. Um, he's the author of several health books and has recently run the London Marathon whilst fasted. Please welcome to the stage the wonderful Steve Bennett. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Um, you know how to keep up with me, don't you? Thank, can I also thank you to my cameraman because they've been absolutely brilliant. And uh, for, Luke, for Luke to spend a day not in the gym is really unusual, so well done, Luke. Um, I thought it brings back to what we're here for, um, which is fixing the NHS one person at a time. And um, no, I can't stand there, Sam. Oh, it has, it's worked. Right. Um, some people have heard this quote before. Some people think it's complete nonsense. And uh, if you Google it, there's a many people think it's a good quote as it is a bad quote. But I really believe in it. And I believe that you should never doubt that a small group of people with good intentions that are committed to change can actually have a massive, massive impact. And this is so important in this room because you've all given up your time yesterday, today, weekend, to travel up to Sheffield because you feel a need to make a difference. And I honestly believe that it is a collection of people like that, you know, in, that we've got in the room today that can save the NHS because we cannot save the NHS carrying it on doing what we're currently Doing. You can't keep putting sticky plasters on a sinking ship, throwing more and more money at it if you don't solve the root cause. And we all know in this room, because we've heard it from all the speakers as a collective theme going through, that many of the diseases that hospitalise people, that kill our loved ones, have a massive preventable element to it. And uh, Sam didn't want me to say this because I haven't got the evidence. But about four out of five hospital beds right now are taken up by people with a disease or a condition that in the large proportion are preventable. I'm going to have to run around the back. There we go. I also want to say something, and I'm sorry to my team that are here from, from, from work. I mention this every single time we have a meeting. I've just added the word conference in. Uh, and that is that absolutely nothing ever happens in a conference or a meeting of any worth whatsoever if we don't take action when we go outside. So if we forget everything we've learned today, yesterday and today, and we go home and we don't make any action, then it, the whole thing's been completely fruitless. So I'd ask you to find out the bits that have resonated with you yesterday and today and uh, over the next few sessions. And then take action when you go outside of this theatre. Because if we don't take action, then we can't save the NHS. If we all, if we could all do what David Unwin's done and get a big mouthpiece, I don't know, David is he's, 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 he's quiet normally, but he's out there. And he's, if we could all get, make that noise happen, then we might get listened to properly and we might be able to save the NHS. So why am I passionate about this? Well, lots of reasons. Uh, I spent 30 years obese, and uh, it wasn't for the want of trying. Um, I've always done exercise. I used to get up at 5 o'clock every morning, go for a run five or six mornings a week. And then I would, as I've learned now, that all that little bit of running I was doing each day, the LucasAid that I had to recover and the Mars bar straight after actually undid all the good that was happening. And, uh, and uh, shopping, because I really love my kids and my wife, I would shop and I'd eat, buy all the low-fat this and the low-fat yogurt and I'd cook at home because I thought that was the right way to go and I'd give my kids orange juice and I would give them those cereals, all the messages on, uh, uh, not knowing that I, certainly my two older children, caused their obesity, um, made me really, really angry. And uh, 
I'm sorry for those who have heard this quick story before. It is a quick one. Uh, Philip on the right there, uh, a Maasai friend of mine. I've spent a lot of time uh, in Tanzania, in Kenya, in Mozambique, because uh, my daytime used to be hunting for gemstones. And, uh, and I was with a Maasai one day, and uh, I went out for a jog in the morning, because I was about to go and do a marathon. And, uh, and I looked like I'd look on the left there. And, uh, and then that afternoon, Philip catches that goat that we're eating there off the bonnet of my, my, my defender. And, uh, and I take the fat off it. And Philip said, Mr. Steve, Mr. Steve, Mr. Big Fat Westerner. He said, uh, he, said uh, he said, you do the running in the morning and you take the fat off my beautiful goat to be Big Fat Westerner. And I went, no, Philip. I do it to look like you, a lean, slender, fit, attractive Maasai man. He went, Mr. Steve, it's not working. <laughs> so that was kind of my epiphany moment, you know. And uh, <laughs> so that's when all things changed. And uh, the same year, my wife got pregnant. And uh, after a seven-year gap, child number seven, I was just about turned 50. And I thought, my god. I'm not going to be around to enjoy this one as I have with my elder children. I better do something about it. And I was fortunate enough that I was running quite a big company at the time that I stepped back from it and recruited some doctors, some nutritionalists, some personal trainers, and pretty much put myself in an incubator for six months and found that everything I had been told by every professional I'd met before was just a lie. Just a lie. And I was fat and I was furious. And uh, hence my second book was called Fat and Furious. Um, I'm just angry because not only me, but I'd been poisoning my kids. And my elder two are in their 30s, and I've got grandchildren, and my elder two now are still quite heavy. In fact, interesting one, my son's a pilot and he uh, wants to fly for Emirates, and Emirates still use BMI as a measurement. And we've had to for the last, um, my, my son currently flies for Jet 2, wants to fly for Emirates. And the last month, we've had to work, we've almost had to incubate him because he had to get his BMI down because it's still a measurement to be a pilot for Emirates. Go figure. And, uh, and the interesting thing is, why is that? It's because dad brought him up on orange juice for breakfast, cereals that had all those health messages on, uh, brown bread, because brown bread's better. Like, um, when people say to me, brown bread or white bread, sure it's better. Yeah. Like, one broken lid's better than two. Um, <laughs> but all this wrong advice, so I'm furious. So I'm standing here in front of you, not so furious, because I can see that it's all going to change, which is great. Um, furious because I lost grandparents. Uh, but this story, I know every single person in the room has got exactly the same story. You know, we've lost loved ones to these diseases. My granddad, my, my nan died at 55. Uh, my uh, Lovely uh, auntie who looks like my grandmother. If the next slide comes up, there we go. Auntie Avis died at 55. Uh, all of us, big family, eating what we thought was good, but obviously turned out not to be. Uh, saddest one uh, a few years back uh, in our family actually wasn't a family member. Um, I must be pointing this in the wrong direction somewhere. <laughs> Behind me. Oh, there you go. Uh, Carl, Carl, lovely man, Carl Lewis. Played in Buckingham Palace, played for the Queen, one of the best pianists in the UK. There's my lovely daughter, Lily. Was around our house four days a week, piano lessons. My kids were becoming awesome pianists. Dropped down dead at 34 with cancer. And for the last two months before he dropped down dead, I was working with him to try and get his diet right. And he knew he had got a problem, but didn't tell anybody. And again, highly preventable. I want to just quickly, and I, I, won't, I won't take much time because I've got such a great panel, and I know you all can't wait to meet them all. Uh, but I just want to summarize a lot of things that we've learned the last couple of days uh, and try and bring it all together. And I, I could have put that slide kind of anywhere in this presentation, uh, but it bothers me a lot, and I thought I'd get it over and done with quite quickly. Um, there is a real problem in the world at the moment that if you're a director of a public listed company, and virtually every food that you eat that comes in a box or in a packet, or a pharmaceutical company, your only obligation as a director of that company is to maximize the return on investment for your shareholders. You don't do that, you can go to jail, right? Where does it say, look after public health? That is the problem we've got in the world today, is that virtually every drug you take, virtually every food you eat, if it's in a box, has not been designed first and foremost, for your health. 
The world is changing. We have something called B corporations start in America. It's on the way to the UK. There's a few B corporations already and it is getting better, but we're a long, long way off. Do not believe anything you read on anything where the director of that company or a public company and it was a public company because corporate greed is what's making all our friends die and, and, and bankrupting the NHS. And we heard from Ben some of the figures about how bad the situation is. Uh, and it's not much dissimilar in the UK, but we reckon only about 12% of adults are healthy. I mean, that's just shocking. And, and it is interesting, actually, when you look, and we can come on to some of my talks all about exercise and what is the right appropriate exercise for the human race. Uh, but it is interesting. It's not because we're lazy anymore. Jogging was only invented about 40 years ago, 50 years ago. There's more gyms than ever. More people are going to gyms. It's not that we're lazy. It must be something else that is happening. So I want to just quickly um, pull together um, all the things we've learned in the last couple of days. Uh, and I confess, and Ben Bickman's around somewhere. Where's Ben? Is Ben still here? Can't see Ben. No. Oh, so what I like then. Um, <laughs> ben Bickman, brilliant. Uh, I, I put this together a couple of years ago, I haven't read Ben's book and spoke to Ben and we did some podcasts and we said, and he was teaching me all this about how all these diseases were kind of interlinked. And now I'm getting even more furious because I hadn't joined the dots before. So my dad's got really, really, really bad diabetes. My mom's got Alzheimer's and is now in a wheelchair. And they've been living together since they were 14, eating every single meal together since they were 14. And when Ben started to paint this picture for me a few years back, it was, my God, they are the same disease, just manifested in a different way. It has to be they've had the same lifestyle. We might call one Alzheimer's, we might call one diabetes. But they must be interlinked because they've had exactly the same lifestyle. And actually, when you look at this... And my dad won't mind me saying this, and if you were here a couple of years ago, you saw me bury him in a coffin and put loads of sugar all over him to try and get a point across. Um, and then if you haven't seen that, it's on YouTube. And, um, and it was interesting at the time, for those of you who weren't here, I put a glass coffin on this stage. We were in London, I think. Uh, I put a glass coffin and I made my dad lie in it, uh, who's a diabetic type too, and we went through his food choices, and I already knew what his food choices were, like raisins and bananas and, you know, and so on. And I'd got buckets of sugar, and every time he said, I eat a bag of raisins each day, I put the appropriate amount of sugar in, I buried him in sugar to prove the point that nobody had told my diabetic dad he was still poisoning himself and making the condition worse. Anyway, I got off a tangent. Um, my dad, yes, my dad was always a bit obese. I can remember being on a beach in Devon at four and him having his foot up with gout. I remember him always being on uh, blood pressure tablets. And when he confessed later on, when I asked him what those were, and he said Viagra, and I was a bit too young to know what Viagra was, uh, it all paints the same picture that now, hopefully many GPs in the route, will now know that there are all signs on the way to either diabetes or certainly hyperinsulinemia. And, uh, and I just wanted to make sure that everybody, if you're going to take one message away this week, took that message away, that as Ben said, and virtually every speaker so far has said, insulin resistance, it's either the root cause of all these illnesses that take up four out of five hospital beds, or if it's not the root cause, it's nearly always present. Now, I'm not a doctor, but I'm just echoing some of the things that, that the people have been telling me. And then if we quickly look at what else we've learned in the last couple of days, what causes that? Well, in the main, we're talking ultra-processed foods. We've learned a lot about seed oils just earlier on today uh, and how that can affect the brain. Sedentary lifestyle, because we, the better our muscles are, the more we can take up sugar without um, the, the need of insulin. Uh, and then stress and so on, but mainly down to processed foods. Feel free to take a copy of that, spread it. That's what we're trying to get the word across. Oh, this is a bit naughty. I took a photo of this earlier on. <laughs> I hope you don't mind, Dr. Reese. Um, but we can see what's going on inside the body with some reasonably quick tests. We can look at the waist to height ratio. We can look at the blood pressure. We can look at the triglycerides, the HDL. Uh, we can look at the ratio between HDL and triglycerides. We can look at the blood glucose level. Five or six simple measurements that gives a really good indication of what's going on inside the body. 
And I think everybody should do it. And that is why, and I'm just quickly going to do this, it's not sales pitch, if you want to talk to us, my team are up outside. Uh, with the help of some brilliant people in this room, we've, we've got, put a kit together. We, uh, obviously blood glucose monitors have been around a long time, tape measures, probably even longer. Um, uh, and blood monitors have been around a long time, but the bit we worked hard on was a simple little device that you could take a blood sample and immediately get your HDL and your triglycerides, because they're a very important marker of the state of insulin sensitivity within the body. And we've put a pack together to try and get people like yourselves to go out and test other people. Uh, and at the same time, obviously you make an income and we, we help a lot of people. Um, not sales pitch. Uh, there's the details and the back end logic of it. You take the, those results, you put the results. Oh, I've gone back one too far. Uh, you take the results, you put them into our website, totally free of charge. And what we've done in a really simplistic way is come up with about 10 dietary plans based on what's going on inside the body. So if you know your state of insulin sensitivity from very poor, as in insulin resistant, up to being insulin sensitive, you can tailor in a very basic crude way the diet to the individual. And why I feel that is really, really, really important is how can you or anybody Use the Eat Well guidelines. And by the way, obviously, when this charity started, it was very much about lobbying. And we've realized that lobbying is difficult. We have to get the grassroots movement because I got involved at the beginning, not the beginning, a few years in, because I thought I could help change the Eat Well guidelines. And my God, it's fallen on deaf ears. Um, although James Cratmull is trying to be an MP at the moment, and I know he will sort this shit out. Um, <laughs> won't you, James? Oh, yeah. But how can you have one eat well guideline for my dad who's diabetic, my mom with Alzheimer's, my growing teenage kids that actually maybe a little bit of rice now and again and the odd baked potato won't be a problem, but feed that to my dad and you're feeding the problem. So what we've done with the website, you take the score in a range and then we put a specific sort of eating plan together based on your score. Very basic, but very easy to understand. And I think... Everybody should know what's going on. In my own corporate, uh, uh, in, in, in Redditch, um, we've got uh, 500 and something employees there. When we did this internally uh, to a lot of people, it was, it was fascinating. We assume everybody has a, like a, a, even a blood pressure test every now and again. So many of the, the younger people in my office have never had a, any of these measurements ever done before. And we identified people that had got diabetes and didn't know they'd got diabetes and so on. So, Prevention, 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 and also cure the curable. That's what we should be talking about. We should be preventing what's pre preventable, and then rather than just using drugs to mask things, can we cure what is curable? And we do know, thanks to David Unwin and people like David, that even type 2 diabetes isn't chronic, isn't progressive, isn't irreversible. It absolutely is. And by measuring people and informing people, that's how we make the changes. Um, just quickly on the website, we are launching, we're taking a massive gamble, we're launching the UK's first health and wellness store and clinic in Grand Central Station on Tuesday this week to try and get this message out about metabolic health uh, from a retail perspective, glossy store next to Boots, and you can go in there for, anyway, we'll go there. Um, and that's happening next week. And uh, on the website, uh, we're looking for people to work with us as practitioners to do the HRM testing. Uh, we have a coaching facility. Uh, if you're already a trained coach, we can just put an advert up for you and, and get coaches. We also have an affiliate program where if you recommend anybody to health results and they buy a supplement or they buy a course or they buy this kit, you get a 10% kickback. But I know you won't want your 10% kickback because you're also lovely people and doing it for the better good. So on there, you can click a button and anything you sell or recommend to somebody that buys the PHC, you get the 10%. I wanted to make an announcement because I thought oh, it'd be nice to make an announcement. And uh, <laughs> I almost got told off for this one as well. Uh, it, this has nothing to do with the PHC, I will say. Uh, but at three o'clock this afternoon, something's happening. Um, and back to my original slide. Never doubt that a small group of people can make a big, big, big difference if they have collective views. And with the help of two wonderful ladies that are in the room. Is Helen still here? She was here yesterday. Is Helen around? 
Hi, Helen. Helen's up there, and uh, Claire, who we just saw earlier on. Uh, there's Claire, Claire's here, and a few others. Um, we're launching something this afternoon, and the reason being, just like, and please, lots of dots in the room, but correct me if I'm wrong on this one, um, in your five years at med school, we don't learn a lot about nutrition, hence probably part of the problem. I don't think, I mean, all our doctors, and I love all my doctor friends, it's the system that's wrong. But I also don't think we teach a lot about menopause, do we? No? We don't talk to a lot about menopause uh, while we're training our wonderful doctors. So while I was a beast for many years, my wife's been bloody grumpy for many years. <laughs> and, and when I started to talk <laughs> to Claire and so on, and the, Dr. Ben Bintman is going, well, the food can make a big difference to the menopause. Well, no, just tell my wife that. Let's just stick on antidepressant drugs, which made her worse. <laughs> Miserable, right? So I thought, well, this is ridiculous. There's a whole thing here, just like diabetes, that nobody's talking about. Of course, it's easy to say, I'm a bloke. Um, but can we do something about it? So anyway, so we, uh, the great help of, of, of and everyone that's helped me, by the way, most of them from the PhD, not a single person has asked for a single penny for their support or their help. Uh, three o'clock this afternoon, we're launching menopause.co.uk, which is an information-only website, which has got tons of videos about the menopause, tons of articles, and it launches with a big forum on there to get the conversation in the public domain about what can be done about it. Because while treatment for some is a very, very good thing to do, it's not the answer for everybody. And, uh, and therefore, a lot of people, uh, we know that it isn't all about diet. We take an absolute balanced view, don't we, Claire? Very balanced view about looking at it holistically and uh, how uh, getting your diet right Getting your hormones, which helps with the hormones, uh, can help with the menopause. So, yeah, that's coming up this afternoon. Information website, launched at three o'clock. Any of you that's suffering with it, go and have a look. We think we've got the content pretty good. Um, and that's what it kind of looks like. Anyway, that's, that's, that's the non bit I wasn't going to do. Uh, we thought we were talking a lot about insulin resistance and metabolic health. Do we have a session on fitness? And then we start to think, well, what's the difference between health and fitness? And there's very few definitions in the dictionary in any way you can go to look at the difference between the two. So I came with, with a concept, and I'd like to actually show hands whether you like this or not. I said, I think good health is when at rest, you're in homeostasis, you're drug-free, your good health would be drug-free, wouldn't it? It would be out of pain, it would be no chronic illnesses and everything being balanced. Would that be a good description of good health? Yeah. Agree? Yeah. Cool, thank you. So then the next one is, well then what is fitness? Because they're, they're kind of slightly different. And then I thought, well, you, let's assume you've got good health, then fitness would be the bit that goes on top. So then we, as we get out of the chair, uh, we got good fitness to move around and, and do beyond just sitting at home. And uh, so we've been talking that for a while and uh, Again, it all comes back to the PHC, which is fantastic. So a few years ago, Dr. Ian Lake, who sadly is not here today, uh, said, I want to do an experiment. I want to do a five-day marathon, four marathons over five days, and uh, we're going to go from uh, London to Bristol. I went, oh, that, that's all right, a good challenge. No food. I went, ooh, <laughs> a bit more of a challenge. Um, and he talked about the whole idea of fasting and Ian Lake, for those of you who don't know, is a type 1 diabetic, which makes it even more difficult, apparently. And uh, so we did that experiment, and uh, a lot of people in the room were, were doing it with us. Ali, who we just heard from earlier on, uh, was doing it. Uh, John Furness was doing it. James Cracknell did it with us. Uh, Doctor, uh, uh, sorry, Nurse Gale, Jerry's around, uh, did it with us. So it was a whole PHC in, uh, sort of vibe, and we, it was September 2020 and in the middle of the pandemic, but it stopped for that short period. And we did it, and we, uh, we took dozens of measurements. We hooked up to machines every single morning. We did breath tests, we did uh, CGMs, we did weight, we did triglycerides, we did everything. And uh, I won't go through all the data right now, um, but it's all up on YouTube. There's an there's a hour documentary on that one. And then uh, last year, uh, a few of us, uh, Dr. Ali Ibrahim, that was here, here earlier, 
and uh, James Cracknell, myself, uh, my son-in-law, uh, and, and a few others, we said, well, let's do it again. Let's measure a few different things. This time we'll cycle 500 miles from Glasgow, and we actually arrived the day before the conference last year in Bristol. And we took all the measurements, again, the triglycerides, the HDL, the blood pressures, and so on, to, and, uh, to see what happens to the human body when you're fueling it purely uh, off body fats. And I won't go into all the detail right now, but we've got all the measurements from every rider and, and what the net effect was. And then um, uh, this year, just come off that. This year I was looking to do something a little bit different, and uh, James was supposed to run the uh, marathon but got injured. Uh, and uh, I badgered James and his wonderful uh, uh, charity Headway to give me his place. And uh, so I did the marathon. I thought, how do I do it different? I thought, well, I'll do a five day fast. Five day fast didn't turn out to be a five day fast because I was on an airline called Eva Air. If you've ever gone Eva Air on the way back from Thailand, their food is really shit. So, uh, and that was about four days before the beginning of my five day fast. So I thought, well, I'm not eating then. And I woke up for breakfast on the plane, and that was just as evil as the, 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 the meal before. And I went, I'm not having that either. And then I realized, I'm, well, I'm only, I'm only two days into a fast. So, so anyway, I did a nine day fast. And, uh, uh, and then I did the London Marathon. And, uh, and, and, and uh, but for the last few weeks before I'd injured myself, I had a problem with my, hip, my knee, my Achilles. And we'll talk about how sensible long running is in a moment. And, uh, but long story short, I did it, and I uh, didn't get a great time, crossed the finishing line, but it was a nine day fast, four hours 40, I think I finished. And, uh, and the most important thing though, was the measurements the day after. Bizarrely, all my measurements were pretty good, and somebody that's always had really, well, I won't say high blood pressure, but it's always a little bit over 120. Um, and a few times in the past, it's been a lot, lot more than that, as Dr. Campbell Murdoch, who's in the room, is a good buddy of mine, uh, tested me once, and I could see he went grey. So, yeah, it, it, it hasn't always been great. And, uh, but, but I recorded the lowest blood pressure I've had in my entire life the day after a nine day fast and the London Marathon. Go figure that one. Um, no, you don't need to clap. So, um, can we get this brilliant panel together? The discussion I want, which is going to be a hard discussion when you see how superbly fit and strong my panel are, is I, I want a discussion, though, about what is the right exercise regime for longevity. Yeah? Because sometimes too much exercise or inappropriate exercise might not be the right thing. I think if we're looking about saving the NHS, if we're, I think if we're looking at how we live healthily, the conversation must be about what is the exercise regime for longevity, and I'll call it left. Longevity, exercise, and fitness training. Uh, and without further ado, can I get the wonderful panel up to, to join me?